I'm John Carter in Moscow, in Havana, Cuba. Now in Kiev, the capital of Ukraine. I'm John Carter in Petra, right here in communist China, reporting from India. Hi, I'm John Carter in the Solomon Islands. I'm John Carter in Soweto, from El Salvador. I'm John Carter in Sydney, Australia. John Carter gives us all reasons to believe. Uh, we want to give you just a tremendous welcome today. Uh, we welcome you to the program which is entitled Reasons to Believe. Now this is a continuation of the first part of the program which was talking about the tremendous prophecy of Daniel chapter 7. In this part of the program we're going to give you the identification marks of the great Antichrist. We believe that faith has got to rest upon evidence. We do not believe in a blind faith. And I'm going to share with you some of the material that I shared with millions of atheists and communists back in the days of the old Soviet Union. I want you to come in the Bible to Daniel chapter 7. This is a pickup from the first part of the program. This is part two, Reasons to Believe. Daniel 7, verse 7. After this I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, or a great nation, dreadful and terrible, exceedingly strong. It had huge hind teeth. It was devouring, breaking in pieces, and trampling the residue with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it. Notice it. And it had uh, ten horns. We noticed in the first program that this great dragon beast is the great power of pagan Rome. We established that in the first section. Now we're going to talk about the ten horns. If you look at verse 24, it says, The ten horns are ten kings who shall arise from this kingdom, come out of Rome. And another shall rise after them, that's the Antichrist. He shall be different from the first ones and shall subdue three kings. The Bible teaches, and this was written hundreds of years before it happened. This prophecy was written about two and a half thousand years ago. And the Bible says there'd be Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. And then it says that the great Roman Empire would be divided as the ten horns represent. And this represents the breakup of the Roman Empire into the kingdoms and the states of Europe. And now people say, are, are you sure? Oh, of course I'm sure. Uh, this is not theology. This has got nothing to do with speculation. This is simply talking about history. The Bible tells me that between about 300 and 500 AD, the old Roman Empire, because of internal rot, was broken up into the kingdoms and the states of Europe. That, my friend, is not faith. That, my friend, is what? It's fact. It's absolute fact. The year was 1991, I was in Moscow and Gorbachev was still in the Kremlin. We were running meetings in the Palace of Culture. Professors from Moscow University just turned up by the hundreds and by the thousands. And this went on live Moscow television, broadcast all over the old Soviet Union. And they asked me this question, why have we been told so many lies? They said, we were told there was, these, these are some of the people who came to the lectures, we were taught that there was no God. We were taught that God was dead. And one professor said to me, look what we did. We murdered 70 million people. Didn't just shoot them, we tortured them to death. Because as Dostoevsky, the great Russian writer said, if there is no God Everything is possible. And so they murdered, they pillaged, and uh, they raped. Let the atheist not forget it. If there is no God, all things are possible. Now back to Daniel 7. Now we're going to see the identification marks of Antichrist, a pseudo-Christian power. Verse 8, I was considering the horns, that's the kings of Europe, and there was another horn, a little one coming up among them, before whom three of the first horns were plucked up by the roots, 
and there in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking uh, pompous things. This is the Antichrist. So the Bible tells me that the Antichrist does not arise in the Americas. He doesn't arise in China. The Bible tells me that the Antichrist arises on the ruins of the Roman Empire. This is not speculation. This is history. And how did Daniel know? Look at verse uh, 23, 24 of the same chapter. Then he said, thus he said, the fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom on earth, that's Rome, which shall be different from all the other kingdoms and shall devour the whole earth, trample it down and break it in pieces. The ten horns are ten kings who shall arise from this kingdom. That's the breakup of the Roman Empire into the kingdoms and the states of Europe. And another, the Antichrist, shall rise after them. He comes up after the kings of Europe. He shall be different from the first ones and shall subdue three kings. So he comes up after the kingdoms of Europe. History tells me that the kingdoms of Europe were pretty much settled by around 500 AD. And so we are looking for a power that comes up in Europe that dominates the world. And he comes up around 500 AD. And the Bible tells me, you remember the text. The Bible says, he shall be different. And the reason this king is different, I'm telling you from the prophecy, is because he's religious. Look in your Bible. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 4. Talking of the Antichrist, it says, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. The Antichrist, uh, the Bible says, sits in the very temple of God. He is a pseudo-Christian power. And you remember the Bible says... He subdues three kings. When this great religious power came on the world scene, there were three powers that withstood his might, the Hoyuli, the Vandals, and uh, the Ostrogoths, and they were destroyed by this religious king who lived on the ruins of the Roman Empire. Look at Daniel 7 and verse 25. It says he's a pompous power. He shall speak pompous words against the Most High. Number one, he speaks pompous words. He's got a big mouth. Shall persecute the saints of the Most High. Let that sink down into the molecules of your minds. He shall persecute the saints of the Most High and shall intend to change times and law. You mess with the law of God. Then the saints shall be given into his hand. He's going to persecute people for a time and times and uh, half a time. It says, this religious power that would rise on the ruins of the Roman Empire would be a persecuting religious power. Um, Listen to me. What happened was this. Church and state join together. I know there are people right here in the United States of America who would love us to have a theocracy and make Jesus the king. And we would have a great religious nation and then you know what would happen. We would start to persecute That's why America is against uh, the union of church and state, in case you didn't know. That's what made America great. But this power persecutes and burns the saints. You say, I've never heard anything like this. Well, I'm sorry. But go and look up on the internet. Go and see about the Inquisition. Tens of thousands of mainly the Roman Catholics, burnt to death and burnt slowly for the glory of God. And Jews, 
and Protestants and anybody who thought outside the box. The genius of Antichrist uh, is the desire to make people conform. If you're a conformist, you're getting ready for the mark of the beast, my friend. And the Bible tells us there were people who refused to conform and they were burnt at the stake. In fact, we now know that this pseudo-Christian power that arose on the ruins of the Roman Empire in Rome put to death millions and millions and millions of people. Check it out. Look at verse 25 again. He shall speak pompous words. He shall speak pompous words against the Most High. You're going to say, we hold upon this earth the place of God Almighty. We can let you into heaven and we can keep you out of heaven. I want you to know the only person that I need to please is the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus died for me and he has the keys to the kingdom. You see? He shall speak pompous words against the Most High, shall persecute the saints of the Most High. A religious power persecuting people. And shall intend to change times and law. He did this. He changed the commandments of God. Then the saints shall be given into his hand for a time and times and half a time. And time, times and half a time is the old way of saying it in the Bible for three and a half years one year times two years and i can prove this come over here to revelation chapter 12 and verse 6 revelation chapter 12 and verse 6 i'm saying to you we want you to have the facts we want you to have the truth we don't want you to have a a fake faith we want your faith to be based upon evidence Revelation chapter 12 and verse 6, then the woman in Bible prophecy, the woman always symbolizes the church. A bad woman is the bad church and a good woman is the good church. Then the woman fled into the wilderness, a place of obscurity, where she has a place prepared by God that they should feed her there. Look at it. 1,260 days. And if you study the prophecies, The prophecies are given in symbolic language. A beast is symbolic of a nation. And these days are symbolic of years. After Constantine the Great, church and state became united. They had a man there who was very charismatic. And they said, uh, he is our Cyrus. He is our mighty leader. Hallelujah, they said. He's going to lead us into the promised land. He became a Christian of a sort. And then what he did, he took the power of the state and he joined it to the power of the church. And remember this, look at me. Church and state joined together is the essence of Antichrist. And I got people here in America and other places saying, we just want to get the church and the state together. You may, and you'll set up Antichrist. That's what you'll do. And you'll get the mark of the beast. That's what you'll get. So Constantine brought it all in. And by about 500 AD, the church had become a colossal power that was persecuting people, burning people, changing the law of God, and this is what they call the Dark Ages, a time of ignorance. And we are going into another Dark Age, I'm telling you, where people are so ignorant of the truth. They're getting brainwashed by television. They're getting brainwashed by the media. They're getting brainwashed by the politicians. Satan is binding the people up into bundles, getting ready to burn them. Say, this is too strong. No, this is old-fashioned 
American theology. This is what the Pilgrim Fathers believed. What, what, what? Yes, 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 yes. This is what the Founding Fathers of America believed. And this power that ruled for more than a thousand years came to an end in 1798 when Napoleon sent one of his generals, General Berthier, down into Rome and took the pontiff prisoner. No. Yes. How do you know? Go on, just go online. Check it out. Check out the Inquisition. Check out the Dark Ages. Check out the French Revolution. Check out General Berthier. And so we're looking here today at a pseudo-Christian power. What educated person can deny these things? You need to think outside the box because Jesus said, you'll know the truth and the truth will make you free. But if you don't know the truth, you'll be in bondage in every way possible. Now look at Daniel 7 and verse 27. Daniel 7, 27. After the rule of Antichrist, then the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and all dominion shall serve and obey him. There is a great event to which everything in history moves Nothing can stop it. It's inexorable. When you study the great prophecy of Daniel 7, you have Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. The division of the Roman Empire into the kingdoms and the states of Europe written down two and a half thousand years ago. Has Richard Dawkins ever studied this? No, of course not. Because he came out of that system. and was kept in darkness. I can understand his anger. Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, the breakup of the Roman Empire. And then the little king who comes. We're going to have a look at this. Look at the following facts. Number one, Babylon. That's a fact. Number two, Medo-Persia. That's a fact. Don't argue about it. Number three, Greece. That's a fact. Number four, Rome. Don't, don't, don't talk to me about faith. And then after Rome came uh, Europe. And then you, uh, they were the ten horns on the Roman beast. And then after Europe, you have the religious kingdom uh, that everybody knows about. Everybody knows about it. Now, if this is true, if this is true, then there is a God. I'm going to read you a statement here. This is pretty heavy stuff. I'm going to quote an old, um, an old historian, Dr. Grattan Ganes. Wish I had a name like that. He says, he wrote in the 19th century, even the Romanists themselves shame you in their clear-sighted comprehension of the issue of this question. Cardinal Manning says, the Catholic Church is either the masterpiece of Satan or the kingdom of the Son of God. You shrink from it, do you? I accept it. Conscience constrains me. Heaven, history compels me. The past, the awful past rises before me. I see the great apostasy. I see the desolation of Christendom. I see the smoking ruins. I see the reign of monsters. I said, well, no, nobody talks. No, of course not. Because political correctness and religious bigotry has us by our throats. Let me tell you this. Look at me. God has got his people in every church. He's got millions in the great Roman Catholic church. My father was a Roman Catholic. He's got them in the Protestant churches. God has got his people everywhere. But we are not talking about people. We're talking about a system that deceived the world. 
and maybe you too. Let me read on what Dr. Ganesh says. I hear their insufferable blasphemies. I see their abominable lives. I see them worshipped by blinded generations, bestowing hallow benedictions, bartering lying indulgences, creating a pa paganized Christianity. If you doubt this, if you've got the stomach for it, go and look at the movie, The Borgias. It was running, you can see it, you don't need to go to a theatre, but you can go on Netflix or something, look at the Borgias. Don't look at it too much. It's so corrupt, so filthy. It's about the Church of the Dark Ages. A fulfilment of Bible prophecy. I see the racks, the dungeons, the stakes. I see that in human inquisition, those fires of Smithfield, that Spanish armada. I see it all. And in the name of the ruin, it is wrought in the church and in the world. In the name of the truth, it has denied. The temple, it has defiled. The God, it has blasphemed. The souls, it has destroyed. In the name of the millions, it has deluded. The millions, it has slaughtered. With noble reformers, with innumerable martyrs, with the saints of ages, I denounce it as the masterpiece of Satan, as the body and soul uh, and essence of Antichrist. This man was not a member of my church. He was an historian, and he dealt in facts. Now, if all this is true, if it is true, you've got facts here today that I hope have disturbed you. If it is true, we come back to the three questions. Where did I come from? I came from God because the Bible is true. Why am I here? I'm here for a purpose. God has got something for me to do. I know why I'm here, and I know where I'm going. There's heaven at last. Poor Richard Dawkins says this, and I'm not critical of him. He says when he dies, he's going to stand on the deck of the sinking ship and salute to nowhere. Here I go. He doesn't say, God help me, because there's no God. He's simply a product of time plus matter plus chance. I say, well, what a lot of ballyhoo. I know, I know prophecy demonstrates that the Bible is true. That's why I have had so much success in talking to atheists. There's an Oxford scholar who said we came from nothing. That's nonsense. Come on, get over it. In Kiev, where we ran a tremendous campaign, I was asked to be present at a march pass of Ukrainian officers and soldiers. We'd baptized so many of them. I stood on the dais. They asked me to take the salute. I said, I don't think so. <laughs> I said, I'm not a general. But at, in that very place, I'd welcomed into Christianity the former leader of the atheists, like Richard Dawkins. He was a professor and he had a job to teach these young men atheism, Marxism. I had the privilege of baptizing him. He gave me a silver cross that I keep in my drawer, a silver cross. He said, I was, the, these guys goose step, you know, just like the Nazis used to goose step. They don't call it goose stepping, but that's how they march. You've got to have pretty strong legs. I probably would last for one second. He said to me, we have been taught atheism. We were brainwashed. He said, we, we've got blood on our hands from the people we killed. Dostoevsky, if there is no God, everything is possible. Everything is permitted. But he said, now at last, I know where I came from. This this, follow my logic. If this book is true and prophecy demonstrates it is, then it tells me of a God who loves me. Hmm? 
and a God who gave his son to die for me. You see? That God came down from glory and died on the cross for my sins. What an idea. And rose from the dead. Not an idea, what a reality. I believe it, not because of faith, but because it happened. You see? So if this is so, I know where I came from. I know why I am here. There is a purpose in living. Jesus said, I have come that they may have life and have it more abundantly. Step out of the grave, start to live. And I know where I'm going. At the end of the road, there's a bright, bright, shining light. Therefore, in view of this, I say to you, in the name of God, believe in the God who believes in you. He believes in you. He sees you. He loves you. Step out of the darkness and step into the sunshine. Believe in the God who believes in you for Jesus' sake. Amen Amen. and amen. Amen. Hello, friend. I'm John Carter. Behind me is the great city of Manila, the capital of the Philippines. Did you know, this is quite amazing. There are more people living in this area than in New York City. And Christ died for these people. We came here, oh, a long time ago, back in 1984. What's that, 34, 35 years ago? And we came here with a team of young people, and we came to the PICC. It is our intent to come here, hire the biggest hall that's available, the greatest outdoor stadium, whatever it takes. You've got more than 20 million souls out here. And I say it again, These are people for whom Christ died. I'm asking you to pray for the people of the Philippines. Please pray for the people here in Metro Manila. And please write to me, John Carter, Post Office Box 1900, Thousand Oaks, California, 91358. In Australia, write to me at Terrigal at the address that is now showing on the screen. We're back in Manila And we're back with a message from God. That message is, Christ died for you. And Christ is coming again soon. Please support us. Write to me today, Post Office Box 1900, Thousand Oaks, California. And also write to me at Terrigal in Australia. Thank you for your support and God bless you. For a copy of today's program, please contact us at P.O. Box 1900, Thousand Oaks, California, 91358. Or in Australia, contact us at P.O. Box 861, Terrigal, New South Wales, 2260. This program is made possible through the generous support of viewers like you. We thank you for your continued support. May God richly bless you.